So I like to introduce Phil Tulos. I might yes, that's right. okay. He will be talking about how to build a SQL-based data warehouse for a trillion rows in Python. He's the principal engineer at AdRoll, and he's originally from Finland. That's right. And he's actually the original creator of Disco. Mm -hmm. So let's welcome Phil Tulos. Thanks. Thank you. Can you hear me in the back? Yes, I guess. Like, it seems to be working. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Ville Tulas. I work at AdRoll. I'm actually leading our internal analytics team kind of that's responsible for building the platform to analyze all the data we have. So um, I was thinking, actually, I just realized, well, actually, let me like, start with one question. So has any of you seen the kind of the presentation that I gave at the kind of the Python meetup last September? I mean, it's like online as well. Yeah, like, OK, at least one. Well, two people. OK, three. So yeah, I mean, like, I could have used the old slides. So I just realized it. Like. Um, Anyway, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm at AdRoll. I'm uh, doing analytics, and like, uh, yeah, I just like, wanted to tell you I'm worried about AdRoll. So what we do is that the, if you ever have, let's say, like, like you, you went to a website to buy a, like, a pair of sneakers or like, headphones or whatever, and then you see those like, uh, annoying ads follow you in Facebook and like, any site like, in Google advertising networks, that's basically us. So, so, so that's what we do. So um, it's called retargeting. And the interesting fact is that actually um, the whole machinery that actually powers advertising these days uh, on the web and actually mobile and whatever, it's actually, it's probably kind of one of the most complex machines that has been ever built by the humankind and, and not many people actually know about it. So it's actually super, super fascinating technically, even though I mean like you might be annoyed by, by those ads that, that follow you. But if you think about it, it's actually, it's actually amazing that how do they actually know that, that I just went to that website? And like, how do they know that actually that's exactly what I was looking for? And, and the reason, of course, why, why um, the system is so intelligent is that there's like lots of money involved. So I mean, there are companies like this one and, like, and, and Google and like Adderall who are actually spent tons of time and, and like really smart people in actually solving these questions. So basically how it works, just like to tell you quickly is that um, so like if you are a customer of Adderall, you add this small piece of JavaScript to your website that basically every time you visit this page, basically sends us a request with the cookie, or we assign you a cookie. So we know that, okay, you were like looking at this site, basically the same thing as, as what Google Analytics and other analytics products do. And you were looking at this page, and this is your identity based on the cookie and so forth. And then the interesting part is that like we actually partner with like many third party like net, uh, advertising networks like Facebook and, and Google and so forth. And then um, when, like, let's say, you go to Facebook, Facebook actually sends us a request containing that cookie or your identity. And like, within 100 milliseconds, we have to decide how much we want to bid on this impression. And that's actually the interesting thing is that, well, I mean, first, it's, a, it's an interesting like, real-time low latency problem. And second, it's, of course, all about data. It's, it's totally, it's a purely like a machine learning problem that like, basically you want to build a model that estimates the value of the customer or these eyeballs at this like, point of time. Uh, given this as advertiser and all, everything, I mean, like as, as well as possible. So it's extremely fascinating. And of course, as you can imagine, I mean, the volume is huge. We are getting hundreds of thousands of requests per second. And that's, of course, a fraction of like, well, let's say what, what Facebook and Google are handling. So um, this talk is about like the analytic system that, that we have built that basically powers all our internal analytics. And uh, well, it's, it's low latency, it's in the memory, it's actually fully SQL compliant, which is kind of a big thing. And, and yeah, it's, it's actually really being used seriously, so it's, it's really not a toy product. And why you should be interested is that actually it's like mostly the core parts are written in Python. So uh, now, I mean, like if like I was like actually sitting there in the audience and I saw this slide, I would probably think that either the guy is crazy or they don't have lots of data. Since I mean, really, I mean, you don't do like big data, uh, really. I mean, or especially like data warehouses in Python. Well, unfortunately, I think it's the former. So I mean, it's it's definitely on the crazy category since uh, we do have lots of data. So like I mentioned, I mean, the volume is is really remarkable. I mean, just like. Basically, we are storing each bit request. Every time we get an opportunity to show an impression, even though we might not be showing an impression, we log that information. Um, also, of course, like every time you click an ad, every time you end up buying something, we collect all the data. So it, it ends up being like really, really kind of a, tons of data every day. So 50 terabytes, 80 billion events. 
And the interesting thing about our system is that it's append only. We basically never delete any, any useful data, of course, like except what's required by, by whatever, like uh, privacy compliance. And, um, and it's very granular. So of course, it's all about understanding very specific segments of users, very specific groups of advertisers, and, and how they are behaving. And um, that it ends up being a lot of data. So the biggest data cube that, that has been built using daily role at ad role actually contains four trillion log lines. So I mean, I guess the kind of the title of the talk originally was some like about billions of data points. Unfortunately, kind of we, we grow pretty fast. So uh, I updated the title to be trillion, trillion rows in a data warehouse. So, so that's, that's kind of interesting technically. Uh, I just like want to give you a brief overview how it looks like. Um, at the high level, like we actually run everything using AWS. It works pretty well for us. We store all the raw data in Amazon S3, which is the storage service. It's actually the log, the log files per se are actually really like in a very like a simple, almost like a CSV-like format, which is like very extremely robust. And, um, and then we use MapReduce to do some like pre-processing for the log files, just like basically the stuff that like MapReduce is, is meant for. And then we have this like a custom data backend that like serves all the real time requests that we are getting from everybody using, using the kind of this analytics platform. And uh, the thing is that like, yeah, there are like a handful of machines powering it, but this is not about like having, having a hugely distributed massive system with like a data uh, or like actually like a physical warehouse, like a full of, full of servers, but actually something quite the opposite. So as, as you will hear soon. The, of course, like that's the backend part that I showed you. This is actually the front end part. Uh, and this is actually the, really the part that matters to the business and like for the actual use of the system. Uh, one of the biggest benefits of actually using SQL proper, like really being fully SQL compliant, is that you can use all the existing tools that have been built uh, that have been built like for BI and like data visualization and whatnot. So, well, for instance, we are using this commercial tool called Tableau. That's like pretty, pretty sleek, uh, like pretty visual way of like slicing and dicing data, building dashboards and reports. But I mean, of course, it's just like one of the tools that you could be using. I mean, given that actually the system is powered by Postgres. So that's actually one of the things. I mean, it's kind of a, a bit annoying that like these days you see like see these systems that kind of say that they do SQL. And like what they mean by SQL is that they have select in all uppercase. But that's exactly not SQL. I mean, what's SQL? It's actually like 400 pages of like ANSI standard, like specifying extremely kind of a minute details of like what you should do in different situations. And like no one in their like a sane mind would actually implement something like that from scratch. So we are just like piggybacking on, on Postgres. And how we do that is that we use this amazing project called uh, Multicorn. And um, thanks to Postgres, Postgres is super awesome in actually in the, in the way that like it exposes this interface called foreign data wrapper that basically allows you to map any external data source as a, like a normal relational table in, inside your like a database. So basically to the user, it seems, like, seems that you are just using a normal relational database. You have a normal relational table. You can do any joins. I mean, you can do full SQL. But actually what happens internally is that like when Postgres sees that you are accessing this table, it sends, well, I mean, there's an API. It actually calls a function that you have defined that basically says that, okay, give me these columns. I mean, like that actually has to satisfy these where clauses and stuff like that. And Multicorn in turn is, is a project written in Python that provides a simple like a Python binding for the C API. So basically it's just a matter of like defining like two methods in, in a Python class and you have a fully functioning relational table. So it's absolutely amazing and you should definitely check it out. So it's at multicorn.org. So, I mean, I, I don't actually know why people are not using it more often because it's just so like super simple way in exposing any, any kind of a data sources to, to like a proper SQL database. And then like actually the multicorn in our case, it actually takes takes the request and then it actually sends it to our like a master server or like one of them, which then in turn distributes it across the across multiple cores. And then like the, the, the kind of the machines then in turn use like this like nice compiler called Numba to compile the kind of uh, the queries to efficient machine code. Uh, but I mean like I, I'll go actually in the details later. So, but I mean like the, maybe the most in interesting question is that like, okay, so why do things in this way in the first place? So I mean like when I say that the AI is, like a low latency in memory, SQL compliant data warehouse. I mean, that's kind of boring since that's like what many companies have been doing for a long time. Uh, also, it's something that like many new companies claim to be doing and, and like you may ask that, okay, so what's the point of like reinventing the wheel kind of? 
And of course, the standard answer is always like what everybody say that, yeah, well, I mean, like kind of they, none of these existing solutions like actually fulfill our needs and like they didn't do this and they didn't do that. And actually that's true in our case as well. Um, the, um, there are like few like specific like uh, requirements that we have. And of course, like we are doing lots of like uh, machine learning as well and like automated data mining. So yeah, it's kind of hard to use, but actually the real reason is it's also, I mean, there's like a deeper technical reason that I, I really want to talk about. And um, really the background is that actually when you are doing purely analytics, meaning that most of the data is immutable since the history doesn't change, actually querying like terabytes or even petabytes of data is super easy. So I mean, this is, I mean, this is kind of like exactly the opposite what you oftentimes hear people saying. And they're, they're the kind of the crucial difference is that like this is not like a, like a normal like a, like a transactional database where you kind of change or like a key value store even like Cassandra or React where you can change anything at any point of time. And then you get these super hard problems in actually keeping data consistent or at least eventually consistent and all that stuff. But this is all about just like accessing like data that doesn't change ever. And that's really easy since what you can do is that you can take a client, any kind of client can be written in Python. And this client is just like sending queries to the backend system. And like what you can do in the backend side is that like you set up a server, you run, let's say, Postgres, it can be Redis, whatever. And uh, you like take, let's say, something like a decent amount of data, like 10 million rows, and you dump it in a database. And of course, I mean, this part like works really pretty well. I mean, you have a client, and like you send a SQL query to a database, and Postgres can handle like 10 million rows, so whatever is the number pretty well. Now, of course, the question is about scalability. So how do you make the scale? Well, I mean, quite simply, you add another machine. So now you can handle 20 million rows. You add another machine, you can handle 30 million rows. You add like four or fifth, and like how many other machines you need? I mean, like, let's say you need like to handle a billion rows and you can only handle 10 million rows per machine decently. Well, I mean, what you do is you just add 100 machines and there you go, or like whatever arbitrary number. And well, I mean, this is something that used to be possible only for um, big companies with tons of capacity, but now with EC2, I mean, like you can do it by yourself. So what I'm saying is that actually like, this is not an engineering issue. I mean, this is not like a super awesome thing that like our engineers built that's something very special per se. I mean, it's an operational issue that like when you start having hundreds of machines or even tens of machines, you have to keep the whole system running. You have to make sure that like there are no network partitioning and like all the machines are operating or the performance is about equally same. And, and like if the machines go down, you have to have a system to kind of launch a new machine. And it's operationally, it's a pain in the ass. I mean, it's like not like a super hard problem otherwise. And of course, what people end up doing is that like you kind of want to solve that question like, like uh, as, as a, like a software thing anyway. So you build like a system like a zookeeper or something to kind of uh, keep track of your cluster and like, like whatnot. But I mean, basically it's an operational issue that you are solving and not an analytic issue. And now the second problem is that actually um, most of that like work is wasted anyways. The problem is that like Actually, like if you have like typical log lines like this, that like, like you have like this, like a JSON events, most of the data is redundant. So I mean, you have like in this case, you have the, like the field names, some like the values are repeating. And, uh, and like actually in this case, I mean, you have about like a three kilobits of data, but only 400 bits of information. And um, note, by the way, that it's not like a, some like a vague, uh, fuzzy definition of information that you hear at some booth at Strata conference, but it's really like an information theoretical entropy. So actually, if you apply lossless compression, I mean, that's the definition of information, and that's actually what, what matters. And just to motivate this point, I mean, this is like a small benchmark that I ran. So let's assume that like you have like a, some amount of information, I guess like it was like a vector of like 10,000 elements. And if you applied like perfect encoding for this piece of data, um, you would have like, let's say the performance is at 10. Note, note that the y axis is, is at the logarithmic scale. Now imagine that like actually, instead of having the perfect encoding, it's actually like JSON. So you have like a field names here and there, maybe like a 64 characters or something like that. Actually like processing the data becomes like 100 times slower. And now imagine that like this was actually like MapReduce or something where you're actually doing this like a scans over massive amounts of data that actually is not relevant to your question. And like you're adding like 32 kilobytes of information or additional kind of a stuff that's not needed there. Um, and suddenly the problem is uh, the kind of the results are produced like 10,000 times slower or 1,000 times slower compared to the original one. So, well, I mean, it's, it's actually a big issue since, I mean, the results are exactly the same. You are just spending a thousand times more time producing the results. Well, now you might say that, may say that, well, I mean, like this is a Python conference. We all are using Python. So, I mean, kind of there's only so much we can do. Python is a high level language. Well, 
I mean, actually, that's, that's not the case. I mean, if you are using things like Numba, I mean, you can definitely kind of uh, like optimize things for, for like high efficiency. Um, well, and that's the thing. I mean, like people do care about latency. People do care about like how long it will take to get the results. And really, I mean, like for most of the analytics, the bottle is, uh, bottleneck is actually uh, the CPU throughput, how much data you can push through the CPU. And now the problem is that like the CPUs care only about the actual data and not the information or entropy. So it's, it's all about how much, how much actually useful work you are doing per time unit. And now if you want to make things faster, you have basically two choices. Given that like the CPU throughput is really like physically limited, it's the hardware limitation, what you can do is that you reduce the amount of data that you handle per CPU. So there what you can do is that you can either increase the number of CPUs, and we are kind of back to the starting point with that like operational headache, or you can increase information density and get rid of that waste. And um, that's of course like easier said than done. I mean, it's a developer headache. How do you actually make that happen? But I mean, the end result is that like, well, things are just faster. So this is like a classical memory hierarchy motivation that you see oftentimes. So this is the same thing, how much time it, produ it takes to produce the same results given different amounts of, of, of redundant data or like whatever, like, like wasted, wasted like, uh, like encoding there, there in, your, in, your, like, uh, in your data set. So basically what you see there is that on the x-axis is the size of the data, how much data you are actually trying to process, and on the y-axis you have that like how many, how many operations you are doing per second. And now as long as you can fit the full data set in question or whatever you need, like the kind of the resident set to answer the query, you can fit it in L3 cache, which in this case happens to be like uh, 23 megabytes um, on this machine. I mean, you can actually really like reach the peak performance like when it comes to integer operations. Immediately when you go out the cache and like you have whatever like your data doesn't fit in the cache anymore, uh, you basically lose 40% of the performance. And if you are so very unlucky that actually your data set doesn't fit in your RAM, I mean, basically it's game over. So I mean, note by the way that like in this case, I mean, it's not zero. I mean, it's like still like 23 operations per second, per, per microsecond. But I mean, it's, I mean, as you can see, I mean, it's, I mean, it's kind of a pointless to talk about low latency at that point. And note by the way, this is not like a rusty old spinning disk, but I mean, this is actually a top notch SSD. But it's just that like there's no competition when it comes to cache. So, like, point is that, like, yeah, I mean, information density makes sense. And now, again, like, motivating that, yeah, I mean, this is a Python conference, but actually, it, this should concern you, you as well, which is that, like, what I mentioned about Numba, which is just, like, really nice, like, a compiler for, for numerical Python by the Continuum guys, I made another small test, like, comparing, like, really, the, pretty much the kind of the most efficient C program that you can imagine, and then the result that you get by just applying that, like, one line of code, say, like, basically one decorator to a Python function that tells Numba to compile it down to uh, machine code using LLVM, basically the difference is only like consistently 30%. And interestingly, by the way, I mean, you can see that like number performs a bit differently when the data goes out the cache. And like, of course, I mean, like when again, I mean, it goes out of RAM, I mean, like nothing matters anymore. Uh, but also another way of putting this is that um, if you can reduce the basically, or if you can increase the information density, or if you can reduce the amount of data you are producing, or if you, what, what you are handling by 30%, there's no difference whether you use C or Python, like with Numba in this case, since, I mean, like anyway, you gain so much by, by processing more useful information per time unit. So the point is that like when people say that, well, I mean, like Python is slow or whatever, yeah, that's kind of true. And of course, actually, yes, I mean, Python would be, I mean, pure Python would be like a thousand times slower by default. But, um, well, I mean, given the right tools and like especially given the fact that like you spend a little slightly more time in actually designing your like encoding and designing your data layout, you gain so much that really, I mean, nothing matters in comparison. So it, it, this is like the whole point of, of this talk is that like, well, I mean, like when, when you want to kind of deal with large amounts of data, that really the thing you should be, you should like really think hard about is, is the information density. How much like a stuff you are like basically processing or like how much like a redundant information like you are like pushing through the CPU. Since if you care about low latency and like really, I mean, you should since, I mean, it actually makes a qualitative difference. I mean, that's, that's really the easiest, easiest way to get there. Of course, the thing is that um, it takes more time. It's kind of, well, I mean, depending on the person, it might be either fun or, or not so fun uh, to kind of uh, like think about that in the beginning. But I mean, the point is that like kind of uh, when you keep using the system over time, I mean, like basically you, you win every day. And that's a big difference to operational stuff, which is uh, quite the opposite. So um, that uh, you kind of pay that like operational cost every day. 
And like a second point is that like kind of answering to the original why question, why Adderall did this like system like internally instead of using something is that, well, I mean like this like information density stuff is really hard to outsource. So, so I mean actually there's this like a kind of a very deep like a theorem, uh, theorem and like a result of the mathematical information theory is that there's a close, I mean actually basically like one-to-one -one relationship between the kind of the probability and the code length. So uh, basically, the, the better you are able to predict your, your data, I mean, the more predictable it is, the smaller the, or the fewer bits you need to encode the data. So basically, this is kind of an interesting intersection of like data science and machine learning and engineering, which is that like if you happen to know your data really well and you can build a model that can predict the data extremely well, it also means that you can apply extremely efficient encoding for the data, and it, which means that like you can build a system that's like really super fast. So, so that's, that's kind of interesting. Also, I mean, like, of course, like, people are always, like, uh, um, saying that, well, I mean, you can't, like, use custom solutions or, or, like, you should be, like, leaving stuff like this to people who know what they are doing, and may maybe so. Um, but, I mean, there are, like, few things that I, I think that are actually working, like, in, like to, uh, to make it easier, like, for people to really kind of build, like, purpose-built systems. One of them is that, well, I mean, it's kind of important. So it's, it's too important to be just outsourced as, as a kind of a non-core business question. Also, um, it's easier these days, of course, to develop software. That's also one of the key points of this talk, that like by using Python, we are able to build more complex algorithms because it's not as painful given an expressive language, which then allows you to actually build more advanced solutions. And then like when it comes to actually keeping these systems running, well, I mean, like, it's, it's a world of difference with, with something like AWS and, and the old ways of working where it, like just getting a server up and running was actually a major, major pain. So, so yeah, I mean, there's uh, like really nothing wrong about like buying an external solution. And of course, like we are doing that all the time. But the thing is that like really, I mean, what you are losing with that is the, is the ability to kind of optimize for your use case, obviously, and it comes with a major operational burden. So, so that's kind of the thing that like you kind of gets often underestimated that really, I mean like what it really takes like have something like Hadoop or something like Cassandra running with petabytes of data like 24 seven and, and so forth. So basically by reducing the number of moving components by having more information density, I mean life just becomes simpler and cheaper. So, well, I mean then actually do the how part of the presentation. So, I mean, this is definitely, I mean, the unfortunate fact is that the system that we have built is not open source. Um, so, unfortunately, I can't just, like, give you, like a, like, a, like, a GitHub link to the GitHub repo and say that, well, I mean, you just, like, try it out by yourself. But even better, I mean, like, I, I can tell you, I mean, like, how you can do the same thing at home. So, it's, it's really not that hard. Um, so, I mean, like, well, I mean, again, I mean, the question is about information density and, like, how you really focus on, on making things fast. Well, really, I mean, if you really go back to the fundamentals and ask yourself that, like, what's the fastest operation that possibly you could do when you get rid of all the kind of the layers and abstractions and, and like, whatever frameworks you, you, you have considered to use. I mean, really, I mean, when the, what, like, uh, really, it's, it's really not turtles all the way down, but, I mean, like, really at the bottom level, what's the fastest operation? It's really the single instruction multiple data vector operations on the, on the CPU. Um, and then, like, well, I mean, if that's the fastest operation, like, what's the most efficient way to, like, access data or store data? Well, obviously, it's something like NumPy matrices or, or just whatever way you have to have, like, densely packed integers or maybe even, like, floating points in, in memory and, of course, in the best case, in the, in the cache. So, I mean, like, we kind of come to this, like, a really nice conclusion that, yeah, kind of matrices are fun and they are really suitable to kind of a modern CPUs. Um, so, I guess that's really not surprising to, to anyone in this audience. Uh, well, I mean, what, what might be kind of a bit more surprising is that uh, actually, like, you can use something like this as a, as a backend for a BI system. So, of course, like many of the talks that we have been hearing in this conference have been about, like, classical high-performance computing or, like, research, like, stuff and, like, linear algebra plan and whatnot. Uh, and not so much about this, like, a, like a boring reality of, like, running, a, like, a business with $150 million in revenue. But really, it really kind of boils down to the same reality that, yeah, I actually kind of, you can, you can like make, make things happen with a matrix. So, and that's what we are doing. It's like our system is all about just having a big matrix. And uh, well, I mean, like how do you actually kind of get from things like this to a matrix? So, I mean, that's kind of a like typical event data what you are seeing. So you have some pretty homogeneous data. Of course, I mean, you don't always have all the fields, but imagine that like you have this like a nice little JSON messages you have some fields, uh, some, some names, some values, um, and that's, that's the raw data you are getting. Well, 
I mean, like obvious thing you can do, I mean, just to make things slightly more efficient is that like you can just get rid of the field names. I mean, it's kind of just like totally redundant. I mean, that's like CSV basically, not, not too complicated. And the next step after this, what you can do is that like you can encode all these things as integers. So like you see, I mean, true, false, I mean, like obviously you can have like zero and one and that's an integer. And like, let's say that like actually originally you had like country is the middle field. So, well, I mean, there's, there's a finite number of countries in the world, maybe like 250. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can have like numbers between one and 250 and those are your countries as integers. And then finally, maybe there's the last column, what is that? So that's the cost field. So that's obvious, obviously an integer. So you have, well, I mean, that's a matrix. It's like three by three matrix. And now actually in our case, if you actually take a little bit like a like bird's eye view to the data, the data looks like this. So, so those are the same fields, I mean, encoded in the same way, I mean, as integers, but that's like a tons of log lines. Uh, what do you see there interestingly is that for first, I mean, it looks kind of sparse, uh, which is that like we don't always have all the fields set. And then actually it's not always sparse since, I mean, there's, there are things like timestamp or, or maybe there's some ID that we always set and then stuff like that. So it's kind of a, but in like an interesting looking matrix. So that's, that's a good starting point. So, I mean, still, I mean, the question remains that like, how do we actually get from this sparse looking matrix to a columnar database that actually we can use to power Tableau or, or like whatever BI you want to do? Well, I mean, the first question, of course, I mean, like if you think SQL is that like you want to run queries like that. So you are kind of uh, like selecting something that like satisfies certain like uh, work laws and like maybe you are aggregating over columns since like that's what you typically do in analytics. So as you can imagine, it's, it's really not that complicated using matrices. So it's basically a, a dot product between the matrix and, an, and a vector that basically defines, it's like an index vector that for each row like tells that like whether that particular um, uh, like where clause is, is being satisfied. So let's say the col like the column value thing there is that like a country equals Sweden. Well, you can have this like a binary vector like that for each log line tells you whether this log line is actually coming from Sweden. And now if ever anyone like wanted to run a query like that, you could just basically take that like an index vector that says if the line is coming from Sweden and then you apply it to a matrix and like then it's just a dot product. I mean, you get the kind of the sums for each column and, and that's your result. Um, just like a, as, as common operation is also that, well, I mean, actually you don't want to kind of have all the columns. Let's say imagine that you can have hundreds of columns. So, I mean, again, I mean, you get just like, like a subset of columns. So how it happens is that, well, you have another like a small matrix that where, or another small vector where you actually just have like zeros and ones, um, zero, like ones for the columns you want to get included and zeros which are not that necessary. And then, and then you have like this diagonal matrix and then you take the dot product. And then again, you can apply the index vector. And again, I mean, that's, that's how you get the result. So, I mean, it's, it's really that easy and like, yeah, I mean, like, then there are like few other things you, you may want to worry about, like whatever, like group buys and then so forth. But that's, that's, that's kind of it. So, I mean, there's, that's it now, the presentation ends. Well, I mean, not so fast. I mean, the problem is that uh, if you have tons of data, and that's actually the first thing I did, and uh, it, it actually works nicely. I mean, you can like push it to GPU and it's, it's really pretty fast. But the problem is that if you imagine that like you had a billion rows in the matrix, maybe 100 columns and like it's a sparse matrix, so only 10% of the, of the cells are actually filled. Uh, well, I mean, now you, there are like different ways to encode the sparse matrix. So you can have like this like columnar representation. So you have a 32-bit column ID and 32-bit value. So it's, it's like 64 bits per, per item. The result is that the matrix is like 600 uh, gigabytes. So you can have a server like with 600 gigabytes of RAM. I mean, it's possible, but it's slightly inconvenient. So it's, it's a bit on the large side. Um, so what can you do? So actually now kind of question to the audience. So if you had a blob like this, I mean like a, like a NumPy, like or well, I mean NumPy doesn't support it, but like a, sci a SciPy sparse uh, matrix and you dump it to disk and then you say like a ZZip and then the file name. So do you think that it will be smaller than 600 gigabytes or, or like is it exactly 600? So any ideas? So and like, uh, and like why it might be smaller if that's the case? That's, that's right. well, I mean, kind of the column ID and the, so you are not like storing everything kind of with that like column ID and value encoding anyways, but yeah. Um, it is, it is um, of course, sparse. And um, well, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, definitely the answer is that it will be smaller. And the reason why it's smaller is that, like, imagine that, like, in this case, you will have 100 columns, 
well, I mean, like you are using like 32 bits to encode that like column ID, even though in practice you only need seven bits. So, I mean, basically for each column ID, you are like wasting, uh, how many is that, like 25 bits. So, I mean, like gzip, of course, can take care of that. And like you have like just like tons of zeros in your data and like gzip just like compresses it away. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's really, I mean, the point is that like, again, I mean, going back to the point that like you should care about information density, really, I mean, like you are not doing a very good job with this since, I mean, Basically, like uh, one interesting result, what I ended up doing and I, what I actually recommend to everybody is that like real men and real women actually de debug their software using ZZIP. So if you, if you see that you can compress your data with ZZIP, you are doing something wrong. Um, so yeah, I mean, you, you actually want to rethink the encoding. And this is just an example of actual like rows in our data. So I, I think that the kind of the graph should be like other way around. So it's just like think that it's uh, like rotated by 90 degrees. So, the uh, red lines are um, the, the base two logarithm of the values uh, in the data. So that's kind of the optimal, the minimal number of bits you would need in the perfect situation. The pink background represents the fact that, that like if you actually look at the maximum value, I mean, that's kind of an easy thing you can do. I mean, you can see that, well, I mean, the maximum value I need to store is like a 16,000. So yeah, I mean, I can just use two bytes to store each of the values or I guess in, in um, in NumPy, yeah, I mean, you have something like U2 or something like that as a, as a D type. So, so you can just use two bytes per, per value. But I mean, the pink background shows that like, of course, I mean, like you are still like wasting tons of space because like most of the values are actually smaller than the whatever, like uh, well, 65,000 for unsigned integers. So uh, one thing that like we ended up doing is that actually you can use this like a variable length encoding for integers. So that's represented by the black line. So w what it does is that like, well, I mean, you could like really do it at the bit level, but that's, that's kind of inconvenient. So you can do it at the byte level. So by default, it uses eight bytes. I mean like one byte, oh sorry, eight bits or one byte um, when it can. And in those cases, when it's not enough, it just like adds one more byte. And that's basically how UTF-8 works as well. So, so basically you see that the, the, those spikes actually represent the cases when, where we end up using as many bytes as the, as the original like max encoding. And by the way, that's what typical columnar databases do. Oftentimes like Amazon Redshift and, and um, it's, it's nice, but I mean, it's still like, rather wasteful. So by doing this, I mean, yeah, you, I mean like you like shave like 50% of the size of the matrix. So that's, that's pretty impressive. Now it's like, like maybe two, 300 gigabytes. And like actually the biggest machine in Amazon is like 244 gigabytes. So you can like fit the matrix in, in RAM already now. By, by just do, by doing this. Well, the other interesting thing what you can do is that um, still, I mean, like if you compress that matrix, it would still, I mean, compress using ZZIP. And, and the reason actually for that is that like if you, if you look at the chart, there are like many kind of a consecutive, like um, consecutive numbers that are the same. So there's like, there are lots of regularities in the data. And the regularities might not be always obvious at first, but I mean, then maybe there are some like transformations that you can apply like basically, let's say it's just like a short the matrix by row. I mean, it's the same information, but you're just like a sorting the, sorting the matrix. And like, like amazingly what happens is that all these like patterns emerge and like actually you see that, well, I mean, like I have tons of repetition in my data. And uh, even more interestingly, of course, the repetition happens at the column level. I mean, you see that those kind of a nice like straight lines. I mean, you can just use something like run length encoding to get rid of them. But uh, like also, I mean, there are like regularities at the row level. And like the, really the interesting like the modeling question is that like for instance what happens with our data and like typically well I mean like 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 a web event data overall is that um, you have lots of dependencies between different columns say I mean like we have a certain campaign that's only running in Sweden which means that like always in the campaign ID is this the um, the uh, the kind of the country country field will be Sweden so it's it's kind of all, always the same. And that's also another thing that you can utilize. You can kind of also kind of utilize that fact to kind of get rid of, get rid of like those like redundancies that you have by storing again and again, I mean, the same information. And there are actually many other tricks that you can do. I mean, like you can kind of do it like gradually. I mean, like kind of start with the simple things. I mean, like gradually see if there are like other things that can be optimized and just like apply different, different methods. So like I mentioned, I mean, like you can use run length encoding to get rid of those like consecutive numbers. You can use dictionary encoding to get rid of like if you have like a repetitive strings. 
uh, you can use like a delta encoding to if you have like a, like a sets of integers. I mean, like what we actually do when we have these like a strings to uh, rows, basically indices. I mean, like you could use a like a bitmap index, or or you can use delta encoding to kind of encode the row uh, row IDs, and that works quite nicely as well. Or then you can get like a little bit fancier and like really start thinking that like can I actually like predict the values and like given the predictions you can actually apply something like Huffman coding to kind of come up with really good like uh, encoding scheme for your data. Well, uh, now of course the kind of a thing after you have gone through the, the whole ordeal of, of like applying this like a crazy different encodings and, and stuff. Um, the problem is that like you can't just like use the numpy dot anymore. I mean, it's like this like a horrible monster data structure that you have created and like there's no way that like you could like anyone could figure out what's going on. So the unfortunate fact is that like you need now, now kind of a bunch of custom code to actually kind of uh, decode, decode the matrix on the fly when you are like performing the operations. And this is exactly what we do. So basically what happens in our system when someone like uh, goes, to, goes to Postgres and like, um, well actually let me, let me show you. Uh, let's see if this works. This is always kind of uh, dangerous to kind of show a live demo. Uh, but I mean, like, on the left-hand side, you actually have like one of the servers like staying idle. I told everyone that they don't touch the server now. Um, and then on the, on the right-hand side, this is by the way, this is just like a normal like a PC equal. Um, and like what you can do here is that like, well, I mean, like, I mean really, I don't know if this works, but let's see. Um, so we can like do like some number of events. Let's like just take a basic number of events. It's just like a, basically a, um, one of the columns saying that like how many how many events of this type we have from from this like one like a nice data cube that contains our uh, RTP data. So now you actually see the Python processes starting that actually do processing and that's the result. Let me actually divide it by some like a number so you can actually figure out what this tries. So. Uh, one and 12 zeros is, is, is a trillion. So it's, it's 4.2 trillion events. So actually uh, what happened there is that uh, when you actually do this like uh, uh, queries in the, in the Postgres, uh, it actually, um, like I mentioned, I mean, it uses foreign data wrapper for uh, the Postgres informs multi-core that, okay, so these are the columns that are being requested. We uh, like have a, our custom like wrapper for a multi corn that like creates this request that goes to the other server, which is hosting the data. And, um, this uh, server actually has a small, well, I mean, it has the process that actually manages all these like a Python processes that we have like one per core. And, um, and then like these Python programs actually see that, okay, so what's exactly the thing that the user is trying to do? And interestingly, given the fact that it's unfortunately kind of complicated, like the, uh, the, the encoding is non-trivial, it actually generates this like a piece of Python code that like looks actually really pretty and readable and easy to understand, but luckily it's automatically generated so you don't mind. But the kind of the key thing here is that like, it actually has the cheat, which is the kind of the magical number function that tells number that okay, so take this function and like compile and optimize it uh, using LLVM to the machine code. And that's actually the thing that actually gets executed against the densely encoded data. And by the way, the key thing here is that like, if you wonder that like, I mean like if you are saying that, well, I mean use like CZIP for debugging, I mean why not just like, I mean like do whatever everybody does that like just compress your data and that's it. Well, the thing is that like if I did that, what would happen is that like of course before I can do any processing, I would need to decompress the data. So first I would like run something like, like unzip and like decompress the matrix. And then again, I mean I have this like a 600 gigabytes of data that I have to push through the CPU. And just imagine how long, long that's going to take. So the kind of the benefit of actually devising, get, coming up with your own encoding is that you don't have to decompress anything. So I mean the data is already exactly in the format that like maximizes the information density given exactly the problems that you want to answer. So I mean again, I mean like I said, I mean this is um, just, uh, just like a normal, normal SQL. So I mean you can do all kinds of stuff here. I mean like you can like a group by, you can like see um, like things by, in this case I guess it's our like advertisable EID. You can see that actually the, the, um, the Python workers are al already finishing and then you can see that okay so like the number of events per in like advertisable. I guess I, I was like really polite and I actually like removed like information that you could use to compete with at all so. Um, and uh, also I mean like you can just do where network equals Facebook. That's all the stuff that like Facebook is sending to us. And again, I mean, it like takes a while probably. 
I mean, it now needs to actually generate an additional piece of code that checks that, yeah, I mean, this is actually this line, is, it has this like a Facebook flag set. And now, I mean, like it has done the filtering and here are the results. And then remember, I mean, like we have like the four trillion rows here. So it's, it's, it's really a non-trivial amount of data. So yeah, number works, it, it works pretty nicely. And uh, yeah, that's it, I'm exactly on time, so thank you. Oh, by the way, yeah, I mean, like, let me, let me just say this first. So, I mean, like, one of the things when people ask me that, okay, so why, why, why I work at AdRoll is that, like, uh, well, I mean, like, of course, there are companies like Facebook that have more data, so data is kind of exciting. But if you look at the data per engineer headcount, like, ratio per day, I mean, it's, like, it's, it's really, really pretty good for us. So, yeah, I mean, we are hiring, so, yeah. So, you said you, it, at some point it generated some Python. It generates it from what? A, a SQL where clause, or? Uh, so, actually, how... Um, the foreign data wrapper works in Postgres is that it gives you a list of columns. Um, like in this case, let me show you. Like in this case, what it would like um, pass to us, it, it would basically push down the advertisable EID. It would push down the number of events. It would push down network. And it says that, okay, so these are the columns that are being requested. And, um, and then like in this case, it would also say there are like, there's a separate like a set of these quals or whatever qualifiers that say that, okay, so the network has to be in, uh, Facebook. And that's kind of the, the data structure that we get from Postgres. And then we push that down to our system and look that, okay, we need to generate a piece of code that like retrieves the advertisable EID, number of events, uh, network, and the network need, needs to equal Facebook. Okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a set of columns and maybe some constraints. Exactly, yeah. Thanks, Bill. I think we're out of time, actually. One more question was right there. One more question, is that? Short question? <laughs> wow. So I'm really interested in um, how, how do you keep your caches pumped? If you're, if you're trying to keep your data in cache, like an L3 cache, and also, um, when you launch these Python processes, they seem to come up pretty quickly. Have you re removed how much you're importing? When oh, you're well, I mean, or like, is it well, just native Python? Because they seem to just come up really quickly. And uh, sometimes, sure. um, you know, when I try to do parallel things, I try to keep them up and running if, if possible. But I mean, like here, I mean, like if you launch just Python, it takes yeah. like, like 10, I mean, what's that, like 10 milliseconds. Right. Uh, so I mean, launching Python is, is really not that slow. I mean, but given, given how long it took to do the entire thing, it was probably a considerable portion of the time compared oh. to the I.O. In, in memory and cache. Um, yeah, so, well, I mean, the, well, yeah, I mean, like, launching Python is one thing. There's some amount of, like, parsing that yeah. needs to happen, but that's, that's really, really, I mean, like, not that substantial. The key part is that um, it's actually, of course, using memory mapping mm -hmm. to, um, like, to kind of bring the, the encoded matrices in memory. And like I, I'm just like relying on the operating system to actually keep those pages in memory. Right. So as as you query more frequently the same page, you'll keep it in system right. cache. And yeah, yeah. Know. I mean, like that's the thing. Okay. You kind of want to be careful yeah. and like about like the, 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 the with the operating system that like it doesn't like come up with some like a crazy idea that it wants to kind of like fault the pages or something. Right. And right. actually, it's also using the CPU pinning, so it's actually a, like a non-uniform memory access machine, so you don't want the kind of a kernel to kind of keep like moving the pages back and forth. But yeah, I mean, basically it's just a just memory right. mapping this stuff. And this is one machine. Do you scale this type of query across yeah. machines? Uh, that's that's the beauty that, of it. And yeah. just imagine the kind of the, 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 the kind of how little operational pain there is to kind of run a one machine instead of like a hive cluster, so. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thanks.